bring this, it's called the anvil, which is in the colon, down to make that nice circled stapled anastomosis. And with laparoscopic surgery, just like in this, where's the beef, you're thinking, well, where are the scars, which is when I'm doing my job right, and we've gotten good, good surgery done with minimal scars. The advantages, of course, there's always the cosmetic advantage of people having less scars. Most of my patients are wanting to have fewer and fewer scars nowadays. There's also the advantage of having less pain. So instead of getting a large cut that takes a long time to heal from, a patient's either going to have anywhere between three and five smaller incisions with a lot less pain. And one thing that we're able to do now, we have other medications that are long-lasting for local anesthetics that can last up to three to five days and help to have less pain where the scar sites are going to be. Also, there's less time in the hospital. Part of the reason for this is that with laparoscopic surgery, we're not manhandling the intestine as much as we might need to. With open surgery, we have to pack off the small intestine because remember, it's kind of trying to wander all over the place. But with laparoscopic surgery, we position the patient and where the intestines sort of fall away, if you will, from where I'm trying to work. And so there's less touching of the tissue, which means that there's faster recovery of the, of the intestines. People are able to eat faster, start having bowel movements faster, and get out of the hospital faster. And then also, because my camera can get right up where I want to be, I have better vision. So instead of being far away from the pelvis and not able to get my head down where I would like it, I can position my camera exactly where I want to be and have very close um, very close up vision. And then also, in my opinion, laparoscopic surgery is easier in certain applications, especially when we're working in the pelvis, which again can be a deep, dark place that's hard to get your hands around. And with laparoscopic surgery, I can get my camera down there and I can get my instruments down there, and it makes it easier to do the surgery. And this gives you an example of what we can do through such small holes. So in this patient, You'll notice that there's a large part of the colon that's missing. Uh, this patient had a um, proctectomy, which is taking out the rectum. And we had to stretch the colon that used to come up here and stretch down in the left upper hand side where the spleen was, where the spleen is, is now stretched down here and we were able to do it with these small incisions. This is where the, the tumor itself, the colon, was taken out and that's the biggest cut. And it's really only about this big. In this patient's case, we were able to take out the left side of the colon. And again, you'll see very small scars. This is a five millimeter, so it's about five millimeter port, so it's about the size of a pencil. This is another five millimeter port. This is a 10 millimeter port, so two pencils. And then we took the specimen out or took the colon out through this incision up here. So again, the largest cut is about this big. The biggest cut on the belly is where we take the specimen out. And we try to keep it as small as possible. Unfortunately, some of the tumors that we take out or some of the colon that we take out is rather inflamed or bulky, and that necessitates a larger, larger scar or cut. But typically, the biggest cut that we have with laparoscopic surgery, again, is where we take the specimen out. And this is an example of what we can take out through those small holes. And actually, in this patient, this is the specimen that came out. And so here you can see that we've taken the blood supply. That's where all of this fatty stuff is. The yellow tissue is the mesentery. And the blood supply is here and then down here. And we've clipped it at its origin. The tissue always shrinks when we take it out so it looks smaller than it really was in the, inside the body. Where you see the tattoo is where the cancer is in this patient's case. And then when we open the specimen, you can actually see the cancer right there with a little bit of the tattoo on it. And the reason why the tattoo is important is when we're doing laparoscopic surgery, I lose certain things. One of the things that I lose is the ability to touch the tissue and find out where the tumor is. And so because of that, when the gastroenterologists do the scopes, they actually can tattoo on the inside. Now, they're not putting in hammers or, you know, I love mom, but they're just, it's a, it's a nice black dot that um, shows us exactly where the tumor is and what we need to take out. And in this patient's case, they had a rectal resection they were not able to be put back together so the plan was to go in and to do a permanent colostomy which is what you're seeing in this picture here the rectal stump has been stapled across and the patient has an end colostomy but we were able to extract the specimen or the colon through where the stone is going to be made so that now you have a five millimeter hole a five millimeter hole a five mil or a ten millimeter hole and then where the colostomy is and so the colostomy is actually the biggest hole that the patient has 
And this is what it looks like when we're doing the work. So again, because of the technolo technological advances, we're able to do more and more laparoscopically. This is a stapler that's being placed across the artery. This is the inferior mesenteric artery. It comes com directly off the aorta, which is the main <coughs> blood pipe in the belly. And the stapler allows us to take that with a surety that it's not going to bleed on us. And we have to get this because, again, all of the lymph nodes are going to be traveling up and in this mesentery, which are important for our staging. And you're going to see the stapler close and fire. They always, the videos always seem to go faster when I'm doing these on my own. You can see that the stapler is closing here. And then I'm just going to open and free up that space. And then here, once we've freed up that space, we're going to, this is for a rectal cancer, so we're going to start dissecting behind the rectum. And again, laparoscopically, we're able to find this plane between the sacrum, which is the tailbone, and the rectum. It's a nice, easy space to do our dissection. It's loose areolar tissue without a, without a blood supply, and we're able to take it. The other thing that's nice about laparoscopic surgery is that we have lighted stents. So I don't know if you can see this blinking that's right down here but that's a stent that's in the ureter because that's one of the structures that can be damaged at the time of surgery if we don't identify it. And so this blinking stent allows us to see the ureter more easily and avoid it. And also with laparoscopic surgery, we're more easily able to see the nerves, which are right here, which go down and into the pelvis, which are important for uh, sexual function as well as urination. And then, I put a small pictograph down here. Remember, we talked about using our instrumentation in an open technique in order to staple across the bottom of the rectum. This is a stapler that's going in that's specially designed to be curved so that it will actually fit down in the pelvis. This is a new thing that's come out in the last couple of years. It used to be that it would take several firings of the stapler to get across the rectum. And what we know from research is that the more stapling we do down on the rectum, the higher the risk of a leak. Because I'm just like a glorified plumber when I do my work. And just like the plumber can come out to your house and you, have, and you still have a leak in the kitchen sink, sometimes we do surgery and between 5 and 15% of the time there's a leak. And sometimes that can be because you've had too many staple firings in order to get completely across the rectum. The reason for multiple staple firings is because the rectum, again, is a narrow area and our staplers are straight instruments and are not able to bend. But the thing that's nice about this, it looks sort of like a field hockey stick, or as my nurse calls it, the shrimp. And it fits right around the rectum. You're going to see me spin it. And then you can see how it's actually incorporating almost the entire rectum in the staple line now. So with one firing, I can actually get a good staple line across that and remove the rectum instead of having to do two, three, or even four firings of a stapler in order to come across. We're going to kind of reposition here because we're trying to get this fatty tissue all the way on the inside. And then you can see that the tumor is going to be, uh, the tattoo, which we saw from the inside, is right around in here. So we have a good distance on the tumor. The distal rectum down towards the anus is up here. And you're going to see the staple fire in just a moment. Right now, you can see this moving. That's our fingers actually in the rectum to make sure that we have a good distance. We're trying to figure out how low we need to go. We're going to open up the stapler. So that we can again push the tissue into it and get a little bit lower down on the rectum. And again, if you look at this pictograph down here, this kind of shows you in the open version what we would be doing. Push that in. And now we have it completely within the gate. You see this small black gate here that helps to hold the tissue in as the staple order is going across it as it's being compressed. And then finally, we're going to have the firing. And you'll actually see the rectum kind of pulling back because it's under tension. And then the stapler comes off. And we have this small little section here, a very small amount. And that's actually not rectum that's involved in that. That's a little bit of the mesentery or the blood supply to the rectum. And we're going to have a smaller stapler come down and take that. And then 
when you think about how do we put this back together, because we used to have to use sutures, this shows a spike coming out of the rectum. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, down here you can see where the, the spike has been placed through the rectum. And then we're going to marry this on. It's just like going to the moon. You have to bring this together, almost like you were in space. And it can be that challenging. And again, you see the blinking from the ureter. That's the light in the stent. And it's going to close up. And it's going to fire a ring of staples and actually cut the central tissue out. And that's how we get people put back together. And then we fill up the, we check to make sure that we haven't twisted it because you don't want the colon to be twisted when it's connected. And then here we've placed water in because they want to check to make sure there's not a leak, which is my biggest concern, or one of them, and that we look for air leaks and we look for air bubbles to come up. So that's laparoscopic surgery. So then a new technological advance that we had was to do single site surgery. So that's actually where you make one incision. So all those surgeries that you just witnessed were five incisions. So this is with one incision. Um, and then again, we're gonna add some technical difficulty because if you'll remember from these previous shots, the instruments are coming off from the side. So the camera's in one fixed place and the instruments are coming in from the side. It's very easy to triangulate. But unfortunately, with single incision surgery, everything's going through this one space. So it's almost like you're targeting down a rifle, which can be very difficult in order to get your optics correct and have good vision and also to be able to triangulate your tissue and spread your tissue. But it allows us to have a patient like this you'll see that the colon is missing and the rectum with a small stoma here. So this is the patient's uh, belly after surgery. They've got their ileostomy or small intestine bag. And this is their cut right there. And that's what we were able to take out through it. So it takes a little bit longer uh, in order to do it because it requires a lot more dexterity and you have to get the angles that you want in order to do it. But you'll notice that this is the cecum. This is where it would go up to the liver, that's the transverse colon, and in this patient's case, their colon was actually fused to itself up by the spleen. It comes down to the sigmoid colon here, and then this is the rectum. And all of that was done through this little incision, which at the time was about a five centimeter incision, but because we went through the belly button, when it shrank down on its own, you can barely even see it. Again, you're not able to triangulate well. It takes a, you can only get a few instruments in through the specialized port. And this is what it looks like when we're going. And then again, you'll notice that instead of having your instruments coming in from the sides, they're all sighting down the camera, almost like looking down a gun. And it's very difficult to get your angles, and it's very difficult to get the, vid, the windows that you want. And so a lot of times patients will come to us and ask for the surgery, but they may not be a good candidate, either because of their size or because of past surgical history and scar tissue. We always try to do our surgeries laparoscopically, and about 80% of the time we stay laparoscopic, and only in 20% of the cases do we have to divert, or excuse me, convert to an open procedure. And I'll show you some instances of what's going on on the inside that makes us do that. Then it comes down to robotic surgery. So again, another technological advance that allows us to do more on the inside. And we're not talking about the robot of old, and we're definitely not talking about Wally. -E. and I promise you that in my operating room I wouldn't let the Terminator come in. But what it is, is a patient cart with arms on it, just like my arms, except they're controlled by the robot. And then we have a console that's actually away from the patient table that's controlling everything. And again, I promise you that no children were involved in your surgery. However, we can all joke around about how they're better at video games than all of us are. And this is the Duke Raleigh uh, colorectal robot. These are the Duke Raleigh colorectal robotic surgeons. Right now, Dr. Farkas and I are the only surgeons at Duke doing robotics. Um, again, this is the console that we use, and these are the robot arms that are attached to the patient cart. And what the advantage is, I mean, it's a big fancy instrument, and of course it costs a lot of money, but one of the advantages is it lets us use wristed motion. So you have to remember when we're doing laparoscopic surgery, I have these big long sticks that either open and close or cut or burn at the very end. And so it's very similar to trying to write a letter from a pencil that's about this long. And you can imagine that your handwriting does not look as good because you're going to have some more artifact in your motion because it's just, you know, whatever tremors you have in your hand are distributed 
three feet down, or not three feet, but two feet down to the end of the instrument. With the robot, it's a fixed thing because it's controlled by the robot. It has wristed motion, and then in addition, it has it slows down your motion. So you can either set it to have one-to-one -one motion, two-to-one motion, or three-to-one motion, meaning that three motions of my hand out here in the real world equal one motion on the inside. So it's much more smooth, much more slow, and very fine motion. And this is a video that the Da Vinci people put out where somebody is actually using it to do origami. And I like origami, so I thought this was a great picture, but these are the robotic arms, and you can see the fine dexterous motion that it's doing. It's making this, you know, um, in this instance, a crane, and then in just a minute, it's gonna put it right next to a penny. And so what they're making is actually the same size as a penny or a dime. And you can see that it's very fine motion. It allows you to have very slow and precise movements. And the other thing that you'll notice in this video that you, um, I'm not sure if you would have noticed it in the laparoscopic pictures, but the camera's not moving. So when we have a laparoscopic surgery, somebody is actually holding the camera for us. And so there's always a little bit of artifact and chatter in the hands. And this gives you a little bit more of a stable platform. So again, opening up the wings. And then everything's done. And then just to give you an idea of how small this thing is, and they're getting something down to there, which is pretty fantastic, a dime instead of a penny, excuse me. And this is what it looks like when we're using it. So here, I've got an instrument that's actually able to hold on to tissue. I've got another instrument that's connected to electricity, and that's actually using electricity to cut through the tissues. We're finding our planes. I have another instrument up here there that's holding other bodily organs out of my way. And then, in this patient, they had adhesions because they had an infection around their sigmoid colon. And so, you can see how I've got one in, or excuse me, there we go. I have one robot arm up here that's holding onto tissue and it's staying still because I can only move two arms at a time because I'm not a three-arm surgeon, I wish. And I'm able to hold onto this and actually make fine motions. And the other thing that's nice, again, you'll notice that the camera's not wobbling. Um, the person that's helping me out is me and I get to put the camera where I want it. And when it's time for me to come in closer so that I can see a little bit better, I can. And you'll watch, this is a nice scarred in area here. That's of course where the abscess was that was previously drained. This patient had diverticulitis and now we're taking their colon out because, because of the abscess. Under here, you'll notice the stent that we use, so it's blinking in red. And then we're able to pull down on the colon and again get this nice loose areolar tissue and bring the camera right up to it so that we can see exactly what needs to be cut without cutting it or without cutting anything else. And then we're going to start realizing that we've made enough progress over here and we're going to go back to the other area in just a minute. And again, nice fine controlled movements. And then I have an assistant, and that's what this extra arm is. And here we're going to start taking down the attachments to the abdominal sidewall. And there are various points when you're doing this type of surgery, especially after an abscess, where you just have to start cutting through the organ that you're trying to take care of. And so in this instance, we're going to cut close to the, close to the colon so that we can preserve some of the structures that are behind the colon, like the ureter and the nerves. But here we've made a nice window behind it. We're cutting through. And then again, that takes care of that nice inflamed area. Now you can see that we're getting into softer tissue. And then this is another advantage of the robot. It's easier to sew. 